I was playing uh, out of the park baseball 23 the other night, and I do play that game often because I really enjoy it. Uh, for those who don't know, it's like a baseball simulation game, computer game for for nerds. Basically, if you've heard of Football Manager, uh, it's that. But for baseball, if you're familiar with Football Manager, and if you're a nerd like me, I recommend you give the game a try. It's super super in depth. It has like a crazy amount of stats and customizable play options. I mean, it's it's almost like you are running your own baseball team in real life. There's a lot you can pour into it. A warning though. It is just as frustrating as watching your team lose in real life uh, because, like, you don't play the game like in LB the show. You don't, like, physically play the game. You just manage the game, and you can manage it like a bench coach. Like, you can make all the decisions and stuff, or you can just simulate them. Uh, but it really is up to your players and, like, how you manage the game. So it's it's just as frustrating to, to lose. But uh, I, I've been playing out of the park baseball, rebuilding the Mariners a little bit, right? And I had I had a night the other night, I'm, and I'm going to give you some backstory here. So Out of the Park is not as kind on the Mariners and some of their players as I think they should be, first of all. Um, like Logan Gilbert and George Kirby are just really not quite as good as they should be in the game for whatever reason. They don't have as much uh, potential overall either, which I think is pretty weird. Uh, and the team in general on paper in this game is just a lower overall in general compared to like how they play in real life. However, what they did get correct is that absolute jabroni John Stanton. His like bio as your owner, they give you like their like what the what the owner kind of wants from you. They obviously set up goals for the year, but what they have for John Stanton just what type of person he is. His uh, his patience level is demanding. His fiscal personality is economizer. His involvement's normal. His priorities balanced. He's in a good mood right now. Uh, I don't go into why later. And his expectation is achieve a winning record. So really shooting for the stars there, John. Economizer is the key to that, though. He has provided me with the ranked uh, 23rd overall budget, uh, which is not very much money. And I'm currently running like the 12th overall payroll in the league at around like 140 million. And that's really pushing it for this budget that he set with me. And it's also going to increase like exponentially over the next like five to 10 years. I've, uh, I've negotiated a lot of extensions that kick in down the road. And I'll deal with that when the time comes, whatever. But this dude, Stanton, he's got me so hamstrung with the budget. Like they got him so correct. This must be what it is like in real life. I can't go a cent over the budget either. And despite, like, increasing ticket revenue the past two seasons a lot, like, he still really hasn't loosened the budget at all, really. So, I had a tough first season uh, in 2022 of this playthrough. Missed the playoffs. Didn't really play great baseball. Overhauled the team in the offseason leading into the 2023 season. And my hard work paid off as we were in the playoff race, in the, in the thick of the playoff race down the stretch. But with 15 games to go, I'm a half game up on the Astros in the division race and two and a half games ahead of the Angels. So it's a tight race. Julio gets hurt. Who's my best player by far? They got him correct in this game. He absolutely rakes. Uh, He gets hurt out for the season. The same inning, Adolis Garcia, who's my center fielder right now, gets hurt out for the season. So in one fell swoop... Not even in between outs. Like, they were playing defense. It was like a ball was hit to both of them. They both got hurt so like at the same time, basically. Uh, so, two of my best offensive players out in one game with uh, 15 games to go in the season in a tight race. Obviously not ideal. I ended up winning that game somehow. And I just can't believe they got hurt in the same inning. Uh, so, the vibes are, are kind of low heading into the next game, right? I was like, surely nothing else could could go really this wrong. Like that's probably the most catastrophic event that could happen. I was wrong. Uh, Rafael Devers, who is my third baseman at this time, he gets hurt, out for the season. So, in two games with two weeks left in the season, back to back games, I lose th- maybe my three best offensive players all year, uh, with the exception of probably Ty France. He's probably in that conversation too. Uh, I I am so down bad after this. I don't even want to play the last two weeks of the season. 
But somehow, I grit out some wins, and I head into the final day of the season tied with the Angels for the third wild card spot. The Astros have already clinched the division by like three games, and the Angels lose. So all I have to do is win my final game at the Texas Rangers to get to the playoffs and make the third wild card spot. I pour everything I have into managing this game. I pull out all the stops. It's basically treating this as a playoff game. It goes to the 17th inning, 2-2, two to two, and I lose on a passed ball with two outs in the bottom of the 17th inning. So I tie the Angels, but they make the playoffs ahead of me. I think they won the head-to-head battle. So I lose out on the playoffs in the last game of the season. The worst part is that I had a plus 67 run differential this year. The Angels had plus 2 run differential. We're both 87 and 75, but I miss out on the playoffs because I lost in the 17th inning on the last game of the season. It's almost too realistic how painful that was. Uh, I really, I had to just sit there. Uh, This was at like midnight. I was doing this. I just had to sit there and contemplate my life for a second. Uh, I don't know if I've ever been that angry at a video game before. What makes it worse, too, is that this game has uh, Pythagorean win-loss, which is a great thing to use in real life as well. It basically just... uh, essentially tells you what your record is based on like an algorithm using your runs scored and runs against like pretty basic um it basically shows like what your raw win loss record if that is what you deserved that year theoretically i ended up with one less win than my pythag record said i should have which is fine that's pretty normal the angels can you guess They ended with six more wins than they should have this year. I just, I just can't win. Luckily, my job is very much not on the line. Because John Stanton really just cares about money in this simulation, just like real life. He said the season was a success. We almost made the playoffs. And I quote, he said, We are on track to complete the goal I set out for you when you signed. Make the playoffs by 2026. End quote. Just ridiculously lame expectations. And going into the next season, the goal didn't change. I missed the playoffs by literally zero games, technically. And that's what he says to me. God, I hate him. I hate him. In real life and in the video game. I just, I I shouldn't have picked the Mariners. I should just do a rebuild of, like, a terrible team to just not deal with John Stanton. I just, I just can't deal with it. And the best part is the first signing of the 2023 offseason... I want to throw this in there, was Jacob deGrom signed with the A's, like three years, 90 million or something. Just ridiculous. The game is very realistic and also at the same time not realistic in that way. Uh, I still recommend it if you're a nerd, but I really like those games. They're not for everyone, but God, it just, I could not believe that I had to say it somewhere. I couldn't believe that happened to me. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that little cold open. How about a little cold open every now and again, huh? When I have a very stupidly interesting story from my personal life, which made me very angry. But how's everyone doing? Glad to be back. Glad to be back podcasting. You know the deal. What happened since the last time we potted? Uh, some Mariner stuff did happen. I will get to that later in the pod. But what happened in the broader world of Major League Baseball since I last podcasted? The Twins came out with some new jerseys. Uh, Very sexy. Very sexy jerseys. Very good work, Twins. I want to throw that in there. I have nothing else to say other than they did the whole new jersey rollout perfectly. I think it incorporates like modern designs with their classic look, and I think they nailed it. Uh, Something I would love to see a lot of other teams do. Um, It reminded me of the Mariners and how I think they should bring back those like 90s uh 90s jerseys the gray ones that like you can picture griffey in it with the very thick ass on the hat uh those are very cool i think they should bring those back they did for like a game i want to say in like 2016 or something because i remember 
I want to say I remember Malik Smith wearing them. Uh, but I think like the the Bellingham Mariner look, if you know what I'm talking about, should bring those back for sure. But way to go, Twins! Honestly, that they they look so good. If you haven't seen them, go go look at them. It's very very sexy. They'll look great on the diamond. What else happened? What else happened? The baseball award show. Uh, Julio was up there, obviously accepting his rookie of the year. Gave a real cool speech. It was awesome to see him uh, accept his award and just be up there in New York with all the other big boys. And just he's growing up so fast right before our eyes, you know. Uh, and and obviously, you know who won the awards, but I want to touch on one thing. Uh, the Justin Verlander and Sandy Alcantara, they accepted their Cy Young Awards for the most valuable pitcher award. They misspelled valuable on the plaque. They left the A out. That's supposed to go after the U and valuable. Like really, guys? How did no how did nobody see that before handing them out on a national stage? How did how, I ju- I how how? That's the only question. I how does that slip through the cracks? Cuz it's not like it's also not like the letters are very small like most valuable pitcher very apparent it's right in front in very big letters and the internet noticed it immediately like it's <laughs> how do how do you miss that it's just classic mlb man they just can't do the easy things right sometimes it's like who cares really but just so funny that like that happened immediately it's like guys really no one looked these over before giving them out you just however you however you make a plaque like that you just made it and called it good or who if someone if there's someone out there an intern a production person someone at the MLB or BBWA who who was tasked to look at the plaques and make sure they went out are they fired now do you feel good about yourself like how do you miss that come on um, the Hall of Fame voting happened as well. Scott Rowland, the only one elected from this ballot. He will join Fred McGriff in Cooperstown. Uh, Todd Helton barely misses out, but he will probably likely be elected next year. I think he ended with like 72-ish percent. Billy Wagner is also pretty close with two years left. I think he will get in. Uh, he made good strides this year. I think he'll get in either next year or the year after on his last ballot. Andrew Jones is on the right track, it looks like, but didn't gain as much as I thought he would this year. Personally, I do think he's a Hall of Famer, but we'll see what happens in the next couple of years of voting. I just think I think he will be a Veterans Committee guy if he doesn't actually make it on the voting ballot. Uh, I think he, you know, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, but... We'll see. We'll see. Uh, Gary Sheffield, another guy who I personally would vote for for the Hall of Fame. He's at like 55% with one year left. It would take a lot for him to get elected next year. I don't see it happening. Another guy I can totally see being a veteran committee dude for sure. Um, it's just interesting. He, I mean, he's at 55%, which is he made some strides from last year, but he, uh, he just has not made it up enough ground. And at least uh, the tracker, I don't think he's projected to to get super close next year unless something really changes. And the last couple of things I want to touch on, Jeff Kent fell off the ballot this year. Uh, it was his last year. He didn't quite make it. Could he be a veterans committee guy? Sure. I don't know if I would have voted for him, but, you know, seems like a fine dude. Wouldn't be upset if he was in the Hall of Fame either. And then the last thing I want to say about the Hall of Fame is there was a writer who voted for R.I. Dickey, which, hell yeah, I would vote for R.I. Dickey just for the shits and giggles, dude. That's awesome. I think it was like a writer who came up with a team who had watched R.I. Dickey for a long time. Like, I want to say, I think it was, I think it was a Blue Jays writer uh, who had watched R.I. Dickey. And I mean, listen, if you want to make a case that he belongs in the Hall of Fame, specifically because he has one of the greatest knuckleballs of all time in an otherwise knuckleball-less world and maybe the last good one we've ever will ever see there's certainly a case to be made i mean he's not going to make the hall of fame but um obvious uh, veterans committee put him in put him in boys 
give it give us the the knuckleballer section of the Hall of Fame or something like I love the R.I. Dickey got a vote that was fantastic but that concludes the Hall of Fame this year I'm sure the discourse was real healthy online I've tended to stay out of it I think I could totally get rabbit hole talking about the Hall of Fame and like what I would vote for but everyone has their own opinions and everyone else thinks everyone else's opinions are wrong and it's just kind of a hellscape on the internet when Hall of Fame voting comes around. So I try to stay out of it. Uh, but it, I'm glad Scott Rowland got elected. Um, looking forward to the speeches with him and Fred McGriff uh, for Cooperstown. It's pretty cool. Uh, what else happened? There was something, some drama on Twitter the other day about uh, the MLB The Show cover. People were big mad, which personally I don't understand. Um from, like, a Mariners fan perspective, I guess, like, we thought it would be Julio on the cover. But, like, you, you know they make these games every year, right? Like, he'll more than likely be on the cover next year in the next couple of years. Like, they make them every year, man. Like, why are we so pissed off that he's not on it right now? Like, it would have been sick, but I'm not, like, pulling hard for him to be on the cover. Like, it's a video game cover. I didn't know, like, people cared that much about this before Jazz was put on it. People were big, big mad. Like, they were bringing up, like, his numbers from last season, (laughs) which is hilarious to me because, one, he was hurt, and, like, also the numbers in his career are pretty damn good, and he projects to be one of the better players in baseball for the next decade plus. So if you want to really bring stats into it, like sure you could back it up that he belongs on the cover but it's also like what is like that's a really stupid reason to point out why a cover was bad especially because it's a video game cover and jazz is one of the coolest players in the league maybe maybe the coolest player in the league right now i'll go out there and say it. he's so sick he's really young he's really exciting and he's awesome and it's great for baseball that he's on the cover of MLB The Show. Like, I don't think there's much more to that. I'm like, who cares about stats? You want to put the the most ward player on there? Like, Mike Trout's n- never been on the cover of MLB The Show, has he? Once? Maybe? Should he be on it every year because he's the best player in baseball? Like, why are we so pissed? I like this. It's also a video game, so predominantly marketed towards younger audiences. I think putting Jazz on there is very cool. A very exciting young player. Especially really important for the kids that look like Jazz in the world. Uh, I think baseball has a lot to do marketing towards that particular demographic. Uh, And I think this is fine. And I think the cover is cool and groovy. And it's not taking itself too seriously. Like a lot of people on the internet are taking this all very seriously. I mean, I love Julio as much as the next guy. Don't get me wrong. However, I'll say this. I think Jazz is cooler than him, just objectively. I think Jazz is just really objectively very cool. And he plays on the East Coast, so if you really want to go that route, generally easier to make that decision uh, compared to Julio, who plays on the Northwest. Like, if you really wanted to to be real analytical about the marketing in this. Uh, but it shouldn't be like that, to be clear. I mean, but there's obviously a clear uh, East Coast bias in baseball coverage. I think everyone sees that. Um I don't know what to do about it. It's, it shouldn't be the case, but that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. But most importantly, and I'll end with this, who cares? Let's not get super mad over a video game cover. Like, don't spend your time being angry about this. It's not It's not worth it. Like, Julio will be on the cover of next year's. If you really dislike Jazz being on the cover, spend the extra money and have Derek Jeter be on your cover of the whatever they're calling it, the deluxe game or whatever, do that instead of being angry about jazz. So that is my piece on MLB The Show. Will I buy it? We'll see. I really, really like out-of-the-park baseball, uh, but I also really like sock and dingers in MLB The Show. So we'll see. And now to the real meat of the episode. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there are some scraps, some measly little morsels left on the free agent market right now. A lot of pitchers are still out there, particularly a lot of quality relievers are still out there. Uh, but besides relievers, who is available 
that I think will and probably should be signed by opening day. Um, Miguel Sano is out there still. Elvis Andrews is available. Jose Iglesias is available. I'm expecting either of those fellas to sign with the Angels, to be honest with you. I think the Angels need another shortstop. Jose Iglesias is a fine shortstop who is pretty durable and will play a lot of baseball at shortstop, which is valuable. Uh, And then Elvis Andrews, surprisingly, had a very good season last year. He won't get more than a year deal. I mean, I think we buy into more of the previous five years than just last year's numbers, but, I mean, he can prove last year he can still play baseball at the major league level. Uh, Jerickson Profile, I've mentioned a lot. He's still available. I think he is probably the mm, probably the best hitter, at least at least the best hitter available still on the free agent market that could go to any team. I mean, he could be very valuable to a contender like he was to the Padres last year, or he could go to the Will Myers route and go to a team like the Reds and just have a good time playing baseball somewhere, not worrying about winning. Uh, Luke Voigt, still out there, still available. Uh, the Franimal. Fran Mill Reyes, uh, he can really hit dingers. Uh, he's still out there. That'd be a fun little ad for any team who just wants to spice things up, get the Franimal in your dugout. And then I think of the pitchers. I'll go into the relievers in a second, but the starting pitcher, I wanted to say, I would have said Granky, but he just re-signed with the Royals, which is cool. Uh, Michael Waka. Michael Waka is still out there, available to be signed by any major league team. Uh, he really had a good season last year, surprisingly. Uh, I feel like he's been in the league for a long time, and I think he still has a decent amount to give at this level, and I'm frankly kind of surprised he's not signed yet. I think he could be a very valuable addition to contending teams. At least he showed last year he can still throw the ball pretty well. So, Michael Waka, for those that are interested. But the relievers, the relievers that are available of particular interest to a one Seattle-based baseball sports team, Andrew Chafin, still available. I'm very vocally praised Andrew Chafin many, many times on this podcast, on Twitter, in my sleep, in my dreams. The Mariners should pursue Andrew Chafin. I don't know. I don't know why he hasn't signed yet. Are they waiting? Is his camp just waiting to see what the other relievers go for? I don't know. I think they'll go for more money now after the Gregory Soto trade happened with the Phillies. I think that kind of not only set the trade market for relievers, but also just what the asking price is. I think definitely valuing lefty relievers more right now, too. Um, But Andrew Chafin, very much available. Michael Fulmer is out there available. Garrett Richards is out there. Matt Whistler, uh, another Matt. Matt Moore, another guy like Chafin, a lefty reliever, whom I think the Mariners should really pursue. Uh, Archie Bradley still out there. Some some more names. Jimmy Nelson, Dominic Leone. Like, there's some decent relievers still out there on the market who honestly don't know when they'll sign. I'm I'm expecting some of these guys to sign uh, before spring, spring training starts, and at least, like, most of them to probably sign before the season, but... I don't know. I can see quite a few of these pitchers and relievers going and not signing before the season and then seeing how things shake out first. But from the Mariners' perspective, they should really pursue Chafin or more. Both still showed last year that that they can pitch, that they are lefty relievers in the bullpen who are good against lefties. Do the Mariners need that? Boy, yeah, they do. I've gone over it a few times now. I mean, the trading of Eric Swanson, I was all for, obviously, for Tay Oscar, but that gets rid of a key piece of your bullpen who was really good against lefties. A very unorthodox right-handed reliever, very good against lefties, but he was. Uh, so it leaves the Mariners with a few options of lefty out of the bullpen, like Tommy Malone is on the team, Nick Marjavicious, Anthony Misowich. Ronis Elias, I guess. Uh, those are the guys who are like right now will be in AAA slash the majors who are lefties. And I'm assuming the Misiewicz, Misamwich man will be in the bullpen as the lefty if they don't sign anyone. I just, I'd rather not rely on I, any of those guys to be the first lefty out of the bullpen this year, uh, especially when 
Chafin and Matt Moore both are still available and wouldn't really cost you that much money short-term or long or long-term. They're relievers and they're not like the elite guys. So they wouldn't cost you a whole lot of money. And it would go a long way in helping out the already good bullpen that has kind of a hole in it. I mean, you have guys who aren't specialists or you have your best bullpen guys. Like Munoz can get anyone out. We're not putting him in against lefties specifically, obviously, but he can get anyone out. Uh, Paul Sewald, we trust righties and lefties getting out. But uh, you need you need a lefty specialist in there. The Eric Swanson and Mishowitz kind of handled last year, but I don't trust Mishowitz as far as I can throw him. And like Nick Marjavicious, Tommy Malone, Ronas Elias, those other guys. Justice Sheffield, is he cleared waivers. He's back in AAA. The lefty crop is not great. It's not great, uh, especially when I like Adam Mako. I wasn't expecting him to come up this year at all, but he was a lefty in the system. I could see getting some play if he really killed it in spring training. Maybe he sees the bullpen more, but he's gone. He went to the Blue Jays. I don't know, man. I don't know. I just don't. I just don't trust it. I just don't trust it. So those are the relievers still available. I just think it's interesting. There's that many relievers. The one, a lot of them hit the market. But uh, it's interesting they've waited this long to sign. I'm wondering if it's a broader MLB thing, like our team's not pursuing them as heavily right now. Did they want to try to get the big guys? Would they rather try to trade for a reliever? Uh, or is it the reliever just kind of waiting to see how the markets play out? Uh, and I think at this point, this is probably the highest of value they'll ever have, right close to spring training, right when teams, uh, pitchers and catchers are reporting. After a huge trade for a reliever that they gave up a lot for a, a premium reliever, the Phillies. Uh, so I think they're in the best spot possible right now to negotiate the most money, I think. So I think we'll see some of those names ticked off the board here soon. Uh, but those are the relievers still available and the broader free agents still available. The offseason really is and has been winding down the past month. Uh, it's been a super fun offseason. I mean, this was probably the best offseason I've ever seen since I've been alive and watching baseball. It was fantastic. Uh, I talked about the market conditions and why uh, this offseason was so fun. Uh, it was not only those conditions, which I talked about, but also just the players that hit the market. Like, you have four premium shortstops hitting the market at the same time. Obviously, that's going to cause some sparks in the offseason, and it certainly did. And then you had some of the better pitchers in the league also hitting the market. Uh, and you have that new CBA making making teams spend a little bit more money and a little bit of extra revenue from that that technology that won't be sold Disney. I, it made for a perfect perfect recipe for what a fantastic offseason we had. So wrapping up this offseason, it's always there's always some scraps left. Uh, but they're valuable scraps. They're scraps that any rat would be lucky to find on the side of the street to help that Rats baseball team win the 2023 World Series, if you know what I mean. So, those are the relievers still available. And now, without further ado, I will get to Mariners news. There is plenty of stuff that happened with the Mariners in the past week or so. Um, first of all, the top 100 prospects were released by MLB Pipeline, and there's a lot of different top 100s finally being released, like Baseball America and and all the other prospect uh, rankings, like the Athletic has one, but there's a lot of prospect lists. But the MLB Pipeline is probably the most anticipated one, and it is like, I think it is, it is the one where you say, oh, he's on the top 100, you're talking about MLB Pipeline, uh, for better or for worse. I think... Like a composite ranking would be better, um, but some people do keep those rankings of like the average of every site's ranking. So good to look at everyone, but feels like uh, the Mariners uh, definitely the past couple of years have depleted the farm. They only have two guys on the top 100 list: Bryce Miller, who was at number 98, and then Harry Ford, who I don't have his number written down, but I want to say it was like 46. Um, point is. Not as many guys on the top 100 as we're used to these past few years, which speaks to um, just how the team has been built out now. Uh, 
I think obviously Bryce Miller really came on the scene last year and is not surprising to see him sneak into the top 100. He really had a fantastic year last year. His stuff certainly looks like it's going to play in the major league level. Like it's just dominant stuff. And then Harry Ford, obviously is not surprising that he's on the top 100. Uh, but only two on here, as I said, speaks to what we've done the past couple of years. I mean, to have two guys on there right now is fine, especially when we've won, uh, graduated a lot of guys from that list in recent years. Julio, Cal Raleigh, George Kirby, Logan Gilbert, Andres Munoz. Like, we graduated all those guys into major league level players now. So, obviously, it's not a terrible thing that they're not on our top 100. They're contributing very nicely to the major league team. Uh, and then, two, the other reason, obviously, we've made a lot of trades to improve the team. Like, we sent probably four or five of, uh, of our top 10 guys who would have been in contention for the top 100, uh, to like the Reds for Luis Castillo, like Novi Marte and, uh, Michael Arroyo. And then like we sent Adam Mako to, uh, the Blue Jays. And then the other Reds trade, like for Eugenio, we sent Brandon Williamson and a couple other guys. Like we've traded a lot of our top prospects for MLB level talent. That's helped make our team so good this year so really like I'm not super surprised that our top 100 only has two guys on it right now uh, and those two guys weren't super surprising uh, and I'm not surprised that Bryce Miller was in the 90s and I actually thought Harry Ford was was higher than expected for me so that's very encouraging uh, and then it's also just good to think about like prospect rankings are far from perfect uh, there are so many good guys who are not on these 100 lists who will have great careers. Uh, I think the Mariners are one of the teams that would have a lot of guys on the next 100 list. I think there's a lot of really high upside teenagers in the system and more underrated guys that just like, you know, I have a different take on them because I pay attention to them more than other underrated guys in other people's systems. But uh, there's just a lot of really high upside in the really low sections of the minors right now that, I wouldn't be surprised in the next year or two to see us uh, have more, you know, four to five to six guys on the top 100 lists uh, with the development that we've shown that the Mariners can do. I think those high upside teenagers will likely start cropping up on more people's lists for sure. That is if we don't trade them away for more good MLB players. I mean, I'm not really against that, um, but... I just wanted to touch on what happened with the top 100, and I really just think, like, not really upset, and nobody should really be upset that we only have two in the top 100. Like, we can't be the Dodgers, who have, like, seven on there every year. They're a machine. They're, uh, I, the Dodgers are ridiculous. Uh, but that was the top 100 list. I mean, obviously looking forward to maybe seeing Bryce Miller in the bigs this year. I don't know, man. We'll see. We'll see. I think he could make it. We'll see how his spring looks. Uh, but I know he's talked about very highly in the system, especially last year. And then uh, this one top 100 list, it's good to see him on there. So that was nice. That was nice for Bryce Miller. Uh, really, the only other thing that's happened is um, the pre-spring training press conference that they had, which revealed a lot of stuff, and it was good to see. Uh, Ryan Divish and the Mariners beat writers back in their bags on Twitter, breaking news from press conferences. Uh, the first thing I would like to touch on is Dylan Moore. A couple things from Dylan Moore. Uh, he had a small setback in his sports hernia surgery recovery. Uh, the, uh, the Mariners don't seem too like worried about it. They think he'll be ready by opening day, which is fine. Um, just sounded like they wanted him to be more ready come the start of spring training, but now it sounds like he... Likely won't be ready for spring training specifically, but maybe the latter stages and then opening day, I'm sure he'll he'll be back for that. Uh, and then it was announced by Jeff Passan that Dylan Moore and the Mariners agreed on a three-year, $8.875 million extension uh, to avoid arbitration and just extend them for three years. Uh, it includes like incentives and escalators uh, that go to above 9 million close to 10 million total uh buys out uh basically one free agent year he would have had two years of arbitration so now we buy out a free agent year i 
think this is a fantastic move. I mean, again, you need guys like this to win the World Series, and he plays every position. He embodies Chaos Ball. Uh, he's definitely a fan favorite. He's had a couple walk-offs, famous for the last few seasons, and a guy who can play that many positions is so valuable to your team, especially at a cost of like $9 million total over three years. That is, This is a great extension. I've been really happy with what the organization has done extension-wise the past few years for sure, uh, and this falls into that category. of I'm very satisfied with this. Very good news. Uh, so really now we're only waiting on Tay Oscar's arbitration decision, which we haven't heard from. I mean, it's not super dramatic. There's only three options. He can either win arbitration, lose arbitration, or we agree or they agree to extend him for a certain amount of years. So we'll see what happens with that. I am waiting to see what happens to see if he wins or loses arbitration because at this point I doubt they extend him. But that, wouldn't that be cool? That'd be sick. Um, other player health stuff that came out of this press conference, uh, Sam Haggerty, he should be good for spring training. He had that groin injury. He seems like he's on the right track to make it back. Uh, I know he was mentioned on Italy's WBC roster, but I think it's up in the air with this injury recovery time, and I'm sure the Mariners would rather him not play on Italy's WBC if he's not completely healthy. They'd probably rather have him in Arizona to monitor him and control what he's doing. Uh, Andres Munoz had that foot surgery after the season ended. He's out of the walking boot. He's throwing now. Sounds like he's good to go and he'll be fine for spring trading and they'll ramp him up. Uh, Evan White is as healthy as he's ever been, according to Ryan Divish. He had multiple surgeries and a very injury-marred past couple years. So uh, I, I do like Evan White. I'm glad he got that extension from us. Uh, a few years ago before all these injuries to just get some guaranteed money, which is really good for him. Obviously, at most this year, he plays a lot in AAA, but is a backup first baseman. We know his glove plays over there. He's a S-tier elite first baseman defender. It's always questions about his bat, uh, and I think this is a big season for him. I think if he can do the bare minimum at the plate... That is good value as a backup first baseman. Uh, it's just it's it's tough because Perry Hill, the infield infield coach, has been so good with Ty France these past couple of years that he's become a great defender at first. So it's not even like we have Ty France who could DH because he's not a great defender at first. Ty France is a good all around first baseman and has proven that. So that has just diminished Evan White's value even more. But obviously, it's good to have a backup first baseman who, at the very least, we know will help the defense. So, at the very least, you know, it's fine. And I hope he's healthy the whole year just for his sake. Uh, and I hope he can put together a little bit more offensively for the team's sake. But good to hear that he's he's healthy and he'll participate in spring training. Uh, Cal Raleigh, as we all know, had that thumb injury during the playoffs last year. Uh, Jared Apoto... I think it was either Jerry Depoto or Justin Hollander said they can't believe he even played in the playoffs because, uh, like, the thumb for any baseball player swinging the the bat would be pretty tough. But he's also a catcher, so just pain. And it was his glove hand, so just pain, just absolute pain. I don't know how I don't know how he played in the playoffs. That's crazy. Uh, but he had the surgery on his left thumb in the off season, uh, and he I know he caught a bullpen session the other day in Arizona. So I think he's good to go for spring training, which is very good to hear. Uh, it was really good to hear about all of these. Uh, I know there was one more Paul Seawald. He had a little elbow cleanup as they call it, which I still understand. I've heard that with the knee cleanup too. They just go in there and scrape some, scrape some shit out of there. I don't know. Uh, he's throwing and should be pitching in spring training as well. So him and Munoz were the big questions pitching wise. Uh, but it's good to hear both of them should be throwing some innings in the spring training and be ready for opening day. This uh, was all very good news, to be honest. There were looming question marks that we weren't super worried about. Um, it was like the team obviously wasn't going to worry the fans at all about these injuries, but it wasn't super encouraging where it's like, okay, we end, we lose in the playoffs, we go to the offseason, Andres Munoz, our best receiver, receiver, wow, reliever, well, 
listen, he could probably play receiver. He could catch some balls from Geno. Uh, he had foot surgery right when the season ends, right? On plant foot, I believe, which is not ideal. Uh, Kyle Raleigh had to have finger surgery. Dylan Moore had to have surgery on uh, abdominal sports hernia. Uh, Sam Haggerty had that injury that had him, that held him out of the playoffs. Uh, and then Paul Seawald just had a little elbow thing that was causing him a little pain, but he played through it. It's very good to hear all those guys sound like they will be participating in spring training, and I'm assuming all of them will be pretty ready for opening day. I think Sam Haggerty might be the one who's not, potentially. Groins are so tough because you could ramp him all the way back, and he could just be running around the bases and pull it again. Like If you've ever had a groin injury... I watch a lot of soccer, and groin injuries are brutal in that sport specifically, too. Any sport you obviously run, but I I think that one is just finicky, and I think I'm probably the most worried about that. And then I'm intrigued to see what Munoz looks like. It's good that he's throwing. I'm intrigued to see if there's any differences in his throwing and spring trading this season. Like, if it's a plant foot and was foot surgery, so... Would that diminish his velocity? Would that allow him to not drive into the ground as hard in his follow through? I like I don't know. It could be a lot of things could happen. I'm just hoping that doesn't affect them at all. Uh, but they do have still plenty of time before opening day, and it sounds like they're all on the right track to return. So that's very good news. Very good news. And then a couple more things before we get out of here. Um, the Mariners. They talked about what guys they anticipate playing in the WBC. Obviously, uh, for the DR, Julio Rodriguez, Teoscar Hernandez, and Diego Castillo are going to play for the DR and will definitely play quite a bit. Uh, DePoto said Luis Castillo is not going to pitch for the Dominican Republic, which is not the Mariners holding him back. Uh, That is a decision that both parties made to not throw in the WBC, and I'm honestly very for it. I think it would have been really cool if he did, obviously. But I am all for Luis Castillo not throwing a bunch of innings right before the season starts. So that is honestly pretty good news to hear. Uh, Eugenio is going to play for Venezuela. Matt Brash uh, for Canada. And who I think he's starting for them, but will be a reliever this season. That's what DePoto said. He's going to be a reliever this season. Um, but I want to say he's going to make starts for Team Canada especially because in my mind I don't I can't think of any pitchers better than him right now who are Canadian, you know? Is Eric Bedard still available to start? Perhaps, I don't know. Uh Matt Festa will be playing for Italy and then obviously Haggerty is a question mark, but he was eligible to play for that team, which would be cool. And then Harry Ford for Great Britain, which is awesome. He'll uh he'll be playing against the the USA team in Arizona for like the group stages. I think him and uh, and Matt Brash of Canada will all be there, and then we'll have to wait to see if USA plays like Dominican Republic later, Venezuela to see if we can get to see uh, the other Mariners in action against Team USA. So that'll be really fun to watch. I'm really glad the BBC is happening. I'm glad these guys are playing in it. Uh, I'm personally the most excited to watch the Dominican Republic team play, but. It should be really fun. I'm particularly hyped to watch Harry Ford play for Great Britain. If I wanted to watch one player in specific, I would absolutely watch him because he had a really good qualifying with them uh, last season, at the end of last season. He absolutely raked for them and looked great behind the behind the dish. So very excited for that. And then just two more things before I, I let you go here. Jerry DePoto said the left field will be a platoon with Kelnick slash Trammell. And AJ Pollock. Uh, our worst fears have been realized. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, this was obviously expected. Um, he obvi- he had to say it. He had to come out and say it. But it was expected. Obviously, like, what else would it be after the lack of signings this free agent uh, off season? We knew this was it. Um, weird to see it in writing from, from DePoto. But that is how things go sometimes and I've spoken my piece on it and I'm really rooting heavily for Kelnick and Trammell this year man I want more than anything for them to 
put it together at the major league level for their sake, for our sake, just for general good vibes of baseball of the baseball team. I just want, you know, one of them putting it together at the major league level would be enough. You know, I'll take that. And I think that'd be awesome. So that's what we'll see in left field. I talked about that last episode. I'm not saying anything more about it. And the last thing that I wanted to say was Jerry Depoto uh, said a lot of things about the Mariners' goals for this year, but this was a quote that stuck, and this was the one that made its rounds. Quote, We feel we got meaningfully better this offseason. Our goal is to win the division, and we feel we can realistically can. End quote. I tweeted, I think, realistically is doing heavy lifting here. I realistically don't think they can win this division. I think the Astros are... Head and shoulders, still the best team in the AL West going into this season. I think the Rangers, the Angels, and us, the Seattle Mariners, all improved. But the Astros also improved their lineup, to be honest. They did lose Justin Verlander, which is a hit to their pitching a little bit, but they improved their lineup at the same time. So, really, realistically, don't think we can win the division. I think it's. I think him saying we realistically can is him um, using realistically in a little bit of an unserious manner there. You know, I do agree with him that we got meaningfully better this off season and I'll have an off season podcast, a recap of uh, our preseason expectations and, and how we improved and did we get better? Spoiler alert. I do think we got meaningfully better. I agree. Realistically win the division. I don't know about that one, bud. Uh, I am pulling so hard for us to win the division, but realistically, mm, I don't think so, but we'll see, we'll see, I'm excited, I'm excited, spring training's almost here, pitchers and catchers are reporting, there's videos from beat writers, there's videos coming out of like Florida and Arizona of people arriving and throwing baseballs to each other, it's just exciting, and it's an exciting time of year, I'm so hyped for spring training to start, I'm so excited for the season, it cannot get here soon enough, and I'm glad they had this press conference here to put our minds at ease about those injuries and uh, express what the Mariners are, are thinking about going into this season. Uh, it's been a huge part of DePoto's reign here as our president of baseball ops of being very vocal and very um, pretty transparent about what they think going into each season and what the team's goals are, uh, so... I think he, he basically said, they set the benchmark last year, making the wild card. I think he just he basically said that is the benchmark now. We have to do that every year, uh, and we have sights at winning the World Series. And he basically said this team can win the World Series. And I think they are a playoff team going into the preseason, and I think any playoff team in the MLB is capable of winning the World Series. Um, this team has some X factors to and then stuff that needs to go well this year to win the World Series, but... Anything could happen, and I'm just glad the the front office at least has a, has a good mindset going into the season. So that is all I have for you today. Thank you all for listening to the Chaos Ball podcast. Please recommend the podcast to your friends and family. It is a legal requirement since you listen to this episode. You have to do that. Uh, another legal requirement is uh, leaving a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, and especially spreading the word of the chaos ball to the masses. So with that, I bid you adieu, and till next time, go Mariners!